A little bit about Olivia's background is that she had a stroke before she was born, so had no idea where, what to do with that information, and I asked the neonatologist, I said, well, what is she gonna be able to do? And they said she might never walk, talk, or see. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And they said, take her home and hope she smiles. Uh, but we set goals throughout the years, and luckily she surpassed those goals. And we just kept moving that bar higher and higher. Hi, my name is Olivia. <laughs> Hi, my name is Olivia. I'm in fifth grade. And literacy was really never on our radar until years later, and I thought, why not? Why not Olivia? I recognized the importance of literacy, but I couldn't do it myself. Thankfully, I was supported by our school district. I first met Olivia last year when I began working as a literacy coach for the district. Um, one of the big takeaways from the data that we got from Olivia was that she had some core phonological deficits that needed uh, to be addressed with explicit instruction. On top of that, she had some letter sound knowledge, but she wasn't proficient in that letter, in those letter sound skills. So I think the the big transformation that Olivia's had um, recently is that we're, we're really focused on the uh, specific steps that we need to take from where she's at right now to where she needs to be. And those steps of learning those letter sounds and having a specific approach and what they're doing, this strategy that they're using with Olivia comes from evidence-based practice, it comes from a brain-based approach, um, and that's what's working. Over the last year, using those evidence-based strategies has been a real breakthrough for Olivia. Um, she is now on the, on the path to becoming a fluent reader. And really more importantly, her, um, her excitement for books and, and wanting to read. And she, she does mention, you know, I want to read to my baby brother, William. So excited to read to my baby brother, William. It's been a great joy watching Olivia unlock the literacy code. So thanks to Mr. Brunn and his team, uh, this approach to literacy has been just the most amazing process. I never thought I would be able to say, sorry, <laughs> um, I never thought I'd be able to say Olivia is reading, um, but she is. I like to read this. Superintendent D. Maria. I don't know how you top that. Um, what a fantastic um, portrayal, right? What a fantastic inspiration. Uh, let's give that video another round of applause. And I'm also, Olivia could not join us today, but her mother and father are here, so I want to introduce Anna and Tom Alt. Please stand. And the literacy coach from Edison Local, um, uh, Miguel Brunt. What a great way to kick off this conference, and I'm so excited to see this room is packed. Um, last year, when we kicked off the first Literacy Academy, um, we had a full house too. We have now gotten to a larger venue, and we have another full house. I think there's almost a thousand people here, and I'm so very, very appreciative, because I know each of you had choices that you could make for where you were going to be today, and you chose to be here. You chose to immerse yourself in an experience that I know will be fulfilling to you around uh, our continued commitment to improving the instruction of literacy in the state of Ohio and really supporting every student, each child. Uh, each child who's our future in their pursuit of mastering literacy in the interest of their continuing educational pursuits. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very much uh, for being, being here today. How many of you were here last year? Raise your hands just so I get a sense. Okay, so we got quite a few newcomers. That's exciting. You've got such a wonderful agenda. I, I always hope when I come to these things that I can stay for the whole thing. 
uh, because there's so much that I too need to learn about this important topic, and I find myself learning things all the time. Uh, you've got such a wonderful array of presenters and speakers, so much great information, and I think the other thing is the opportunity to just interact with each other and network about all the great things that are happening in the state of Ohio. I so love seeing all these people in this room because to me it really captures the energy that is building around literacy in the state. Um, I think we were doing some things as a state, um, you know, years ago, um, uh, and then, you know, a short time ago, uh, I think with the Striving Readers Grant, that gave us another huge boost, and we've got so many teams uh, doing incredible work across the state with great supports from the ESCs, from the SSTs, uh, and so forth and so on. It's exciting. When you came in today, um, you should have received our little uh, placemat around the strategic plan. How many of you are familiar with Ohio Strategic Plan for Education? Great, I love it when I see so many hands go up. And you'll know that, that at the core of that plan is meeting the needs of the whole child, right? And I, and I think each and every day, we as educators are confronted with that reality and push ourselves to say, how am I a part of the process of meeting the needs of the children that are in my care and custody on each particular day. Um, and this notion of each child, our future, really calls to us to be very personalized, very customized in our relationships, in our instruction, in our approach to that educational experience and creating an educational experience for every child. That's why I love this video about Olivia. I love this video about Olivia because it starts out with a I think a simple idea, right? You gotta believe. You gotta believe. Olivia's mom and dad, the literacy coach, people said, you know what? Th this is not beyond our capacity. Here's this beautiful child, and look how far this child has come, overcoming all kinds of obstacles. Why not, right? Why not? Why not literacy? And if Olivia can, can feel the power of that belief, feel the power of that hope, feel the power of the encouragement that the adults surrounding her had for her ability to reach those levels, then every child can do that. Every child can do that. And we can be partners in creating that experience for every child. And so the idea of each child, our future, is exactly that. Let's believe. Let's not give ourselves reasons that we can't, let's find the ways and the reasons that we can. Because ultimately, if we apply ourselves, we see stories like Olivia time and time and time and time again, when people felt like, I can't seem to be getting through to this child or that child or some other child, and yet, after working on it and sort of um, getting additional help or asking questions or seeking out different approaches, we are successful. And I think that's what makes us strong. That's what brings us together. And those are the kinds of experiences we can share with each other as we continue to work to, uh, to advance the cause of helping every student master the concepts of literacy because at the end of the day, we recognize how important that is to each and every student's future success. That's why when you look at the placemat for the strategic plan, you'll see at the bottom, one of the key 10 strategies is really focused on literacy because we recognize its primary importance and the fact that we have to commit ourselves to ensuring that students not only emerge with the abilities to, you know, it sounds so sterile when we talk about, you know, literacy capacities, literacy skills, but it's really a love, a love of learning that's derived from literacy because literacy allows us to unlock that joy of discovery, that joy of learning each and every day of our, of our lives until we end it. I know I find myself in that position. I know many of you find yourselves in that position. And it's something that we sometimes take for granted in terms of, what its, uh, what its value is to us. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for coming today. You're gonna have an exciting day, um, and I'm sure if, uh, because, and the reason I say that is because last year, I gotta tell you, many of you know, if you follow me, you know I'm out and about, you know, visiting schools, uh, going to different conferences and so forth and so on. I had more people come to me last year after our State Literacy Academy saying, oh, that Literacy Academy, that was so powerful. Than, than any other conference that I have, have been a part of. So I, I know the staff has you know, gone even the extra mile with, um, with today's schedule, today's uh, presentations, and the fact that we've expanded the experience to cover two days I think is really exciting because you're going to find both things that are meaningful to you and things that maybe you, you never understood before. You're, you're taking a risk going into a session and you come out saying, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. 
To kick us off today, we have an absolutely phenomenal keynote speaker. And you know, one of the things I, you know, if you go to a lot of conferences, you get into the habit of, of um, you know, using handouts as a, as a way to gauge the excellence of a speaker. And I love uh, Dr. Archer's handouts that are on your table, right? Um, just, just look at it. I mean, it, it, just, it just exudes enthusiasm. It exudes um, a love for this field. And I think that's the kind of thing you will find in Dr. Anita Archer. I love the fact that the issue is instruction and her, one of her key specialties is in explicit instruction. You'll see that strategy number three is actually the strategy in the strategic plan that focuses on instructional practice. And the reason it's there is because in so many, 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 many conversations that we have, that experience in the classroom, that, that beautiful meeting of, of teacher, learner, and content in that instructional setting, that's what makes learning happen. That's what supports the acquisition of knowledge and skills in our students, and it truly is magic. And I don't mean magic in sort of that mysterious sort of, we don't really know how it happens, but it's a magical experience because of the outcomes that are achieved. And so I love the fact that the title of this handout is the magic is in the instruction, because I think it's so true. As someone who visits a school and watches teachers from time to time, I, I, I am awed by high quality instruction because in many ways it is pure magic. And then I love this emphasis on learning, learning, learning. I think the word learning is like two dozen times on this, on this page. And then the tag at the end is teach with passion. Teach with passion, manage with compassion. What, what a great inspiring way to tee off this conference because I think just coming here is a symbol of your personal passion about the work you do and the compassion that you feel for the students that are in your care and custody. And so I love, uh, 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 Dr. Archer has a long track record. She's authored a variety of publications. She has conducted hundreds of these kinds of sessions. It's such an honor for us to have her here today. She hails from Portland, Oregon. She has previously been on the faculty at the University of Oregon, University of Washington, San Diego uh, State University. Um, some of you may have heard her because she was recently in Ohio doing a week-long session for some of our ESC and, and other uh, literacy coordinators on the, the, um, the uh, subject of explicit instruction. So you're in for an exciting presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anita Archer. First of all, I just want to tell you, I've looked forward to this day. I did have a wonderful week last June right here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Raise your hand if you were there. Okay, all across the room uh, and uh, just enjoyed every minute of it. My home is in Portland, Oregon, and I have to tell you that uh, I was very excited to learn that if I would stay the rest of the week, I could go see my alma mater, uh, University of Washington, play right here. Uh, but here's what happened. Uh, so I flew, I was in Michigan last week. I flew back to um, Portland, Oregon, because my friends who were going to Europe wanted to have an early birthday party for me, and I thought maybe I should go. Uh, so I went to it, uh, but I flew all the way across country and then all the way back. Uh, and uh, so during that time, uh, I was to meet some people, uh, a really good friend of mine, for dinner at 6 o'clock, but I didn't change my uh, watch uh, from Houston. Uh, and so, uh, and I turned off my phone on the airplane. Uh, so I I was in my room, and he's looking all over for me, and i just totally happy because I got to watch the brackets. <laughs> woo uh, And um, learn that, woo, Ohio State, go Ohio State, is in there. And so is Cincinnati. Uh, woo, woo, gets to be right here. Maybe you're not into basketball, uh, but... <laughs> 
it reminds me of the kind of work they put into it for excellence. And isn't that very parallel to the work that we have to and never give up? Certainly, no one gave up on Olivia, uh, and we cannot give up on anyone else, but the work it takes. Uh, and it's not work for one time, it is work for eternity. Uh, and I hope the ducks start working again. Anyway, uh, but uh, it just reminded me of that kind of energy that we have to bring to our classroom and bring here. So two weeks ago, uh, I, two weeks ago, I was in Modesto, California, uh, and uh, I was teaching demonstration lessons in elementary and the middle school and the high school. Uh, and uh, I ha had a wonderful time teaching, but it appeared to me that some of the students were not like riveted to my every word. And raise your hand if you've ever had at your school site lack of rivet. Uh, uh, and so the only response is as much active participation as possible. Uh, that good is always interactive. I say something, you say something, I write something, you write something, I do something, you do something. It never, ever, ever can be. I say something, I say something, I say something. So, I know this is not the usual key, but my preference is to constantly remind us what we need in the classroom. So you're going to participate. Uh, one thing you're going to do is sometimes say answers together. I'll ask a question. I'll put up my hands. This says, think, do not blurt. And then when I lower my hands, you're going to say the answer. So, uh, for example, uh, what month is it, everyone? It is March. March. And the most important event after the literacy conference is March Madness. It is what, everyone? March, March Madness. Madness. So... When I was speaking a week ago uh, in, at UCLA, the superintendent uh, of Los Angeles schools were there, uh, and he kept blurting out the answer. So I had to give him a personal signal. Uh, and we hope we don't need to do it for you. All right, no, okay. So sometimes you're going to share answers with a partner at your table. Get a partner. If you have an odd table, uh, make a trio, middle person one, other two twos. Everybody needs a partner. Give yourself the numbers one and two. Leave no one out and go. We're honored to see you, David. Kay. Turn and stare at your partner. And raise your hand if you're a one. And raise your hand if you're a two. And raise your hand if you're a two. OK. See, already I found people I'd have to monitor. Uh, OK. So, well, I was given the gift of uh, being able to select exactly what the keynote would be on. And first of all, if you look through your program, this would match the program uh, of this conference, match any national program in the area of literacy. Woo! Uh, you didn't even have to leave the state uh, right here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and they will talk about things such as um, advanced phonological awareness. Um, David Kilpatrick will be speaking about that. Uh, you have ones on uh, teaching morphographs within words to increase vocabulary. Uh, but as I looked through all of it, I said the one thing we have to remember that goes over all of it is the quality of instruction that we are given. Uh, because we could have a reading program. Uh, we could have uh, advanced phonological awareness. We could have writing instruction. But unless the instruction is alive, uh, instruction is passionate, uh, then it may not make any difference. So uh, on this sheet, uh, I sort of pulled out sort of the biggest ideas on instruction. And one of the things I have done for my whole career is made up little mottos to uh, remind my students at uh, university uh, or participants in workshops such as the one I did here to remember the big ideas. And they're on that one called well, my students gave it this name. What's the archerism? <laughs> See that column? So you have to keep this uh, near you because you're going to be participating with you. 
so we do know that instruction uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, and uh, so um, I wrote a book on explicit instruction, but also another book that I found extraordinarily useful that came out in the last two years, uh, creating the schools that our student, our children need. Uh, I sort of drew from that also for today. Uh, and so what makes a difference in terms of our schools? I met some people here already to, today, three different people who work with school improvement. And what we know about school improvement is uh, we need to focus on instruction uh, and instruction and instruction to make a difference. So in his new book, uh, uh, Dylan William, which is spelled correctly. I've already had one person try to correct it, but he, he, it's just one L. Okay, so he says this, and everybody reading it with me, and go. The quality of teachers is the single most important factor in the educational system. Now, I read that, and I said to myself, we have often sort of looked at instruction saying, this is a great teacher, uh, this is a really great teacher, as if it was their persona. But really, it was their teaching. Let me prove it to you. Think about your career as a teacher. Was there a lesson that you did that you just wished like the superintendent was there, uh, that the principal was there, uh, that the parents, I mean, it was like good. It was like really, really, really good. Raise your hand if you've had that kind of lesson. Of course you have. And raise your hand if you've had a lesson where you really hoped that the principal was otherwise occupied. Uh, okay. So it is not our persona. It is the teaching that we bring to it. And our job is to lift more into uh, those really, really great lessons uh, where we guarantee uh, the quality of instruction has also led to the quality of learning. Uh, so without his permission, I didn't even like email him. Uh, I just edited this to the truth uh, and read the reworded one and go. The quality of teaching is the single most important factor in the educational system. And this is absolutely the truth. Uh, every day, every period, every moment, it is the quality of instruction. Uh, and one of the studies that uh, really focused on this over time was one uh, that was longitudinal. And I just plucked out here the second grade data. Uh, and so looking at the students at the 50th percentile. Uh, and if they had three teachers who consistently uh, got the very highest performance from their students, uh, the students at the 50th percentile ended up at the 90th percentile. Uh, and if they were uh, with a teacher who was less likely to bring about that kind of gain for three years, they learned, ended up at the 37th percentile. And so if it was your very own second grader, uh, would you want them to end up at the 90th or the 37th percentile? Everyone, the 90th. And that is certainly what we'd want to do uh, as educators. Um, now, many of you are here who uh, in intervention and in special ed. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if that would be your role, that you work in special ed or intervention. OK, raise your hand have any low performing students at your school. Okay, all right, good. So one of the things we know about instruction is uh, that uh, students that are struggling particularly benefit from the highest quality instruction. That does not mean that gifted kids do, do not deserve it, they do, but that the very highest uh, performing students are more able to cope with less than perfect instruction and the lowest performing students, if we're going to make a difference, really need the highest quality. Uh, and so we're going to end up with one more. Uh, and I just want you to read the reworded one here. Uh, and with me and go. The quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of the teaching. Uh, so that is what we're all about. No matter what our role is, from the superintendent of your great state uh, to the principals, the administrators, uh, all of the consultants here, it is all about creating a essence that makes a huge difference uh, with our students. Um, 
So we are going to uh, look at explicit instruction. And I've already been asked this question. Uh, wouldn't it be better for children uh, if they would have uh, authentic experiences and discover information uh, through those experiences? But then when we look at research, we do find the power uh, is in pretty explicit instruction, particularly under three circumstances. Number one uh, is if you are learning information where you are a novice and have absolutely no background knowledge, then it appears that you particularly benefit from explicit instruction. Uh, and so I am going to bet that at your school sites that you have times where uh, students are novices learning new information uh, and uh, have no background knowledge. And those seem to be the characteristics of it. So this fall, I had like a perfect uh, experience to remind me of how useful it is to have background knowledge uh, uh, in order to be able to solve a problem. So I was in Australia teaching. Uh, I teach there about two months a year uh, in the fall. Uh, and I was going to fly back to my home in Portland and then fly out the next day. And so my assistant emailed me, Anita, uh, there's a big problem in Portland. I said, what kind of big problem? He said, the washing machine doesn't work. And you are coming home. You need to wash your underwear. It's really important. Uh, and get your clothes uh, washed so that you can fly off again. He said, but on Saturday, I'm hoping to solve the problem. I said, well, what are you planning to do? He said, well, uh, I plan to uh, have uh, a technician come in in the morning and see if he can fix it. I said, excellent. And he said, but there's a backup plan. Uh, it is a small area. It's a double-decker. I've gone out. I found one. It's $6,000, but they will install it in the afternoon, and you can wash your clothes in the afternoon. I said, wonderful. And he said, I'll come in early Saturday uh, before the technician gets there. I said, excellent. So he came in about an hour before. And so we sat down, uh, and uh, I said, maybe we figure it out. <laughs> Where's the manual? So we got the manual. Uh, and so we're sitting down, and we are studying the manual. And we are studying the manual. And the first thing we couldn't figure out is how to get the front off so we could see the motor. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so about an hour later, we're still studying the manual. But we're very proud of ourselves because we the manual. Uh, but we could not discover at all how to fix this. Uh, and so uh, in walks Jason, technician. Uh, he signs his invoice, uh, Ice Cube, because he's a chip off the old block of his father who owns the company. Okay. And I, I said, well, no, Jason, we've studied the manual. <laughs> we didn't figure anything out, but we did study it. It appears that maybe we don't have an adequate amount of background knowledge, like none, uh, that we didn't know the vocabulary or the skills or the strategy that you could use. And he said, well, that's why you called me. Uh, he said, let me see if I can figure it out. So he goes over and turns one knob. He said, just like I thought. Uh, I've worked on this um, machine many, many times, and there's three plastic parts that wear out, and uh, they, I think they need to be replaced. I said, how would you ever, oh, oh, I've worked on it so much. I know how to solve this problem. You just turn this knob, and you listen to it, and then you know. I said, ooh. Uh, and so he said, well, I've got the three parts in my car. And I said, all right. He said, do you want me to get them? I said, yeah, run out and get them. Uh, so he came back, and uh, about 15 minutes later, he's installed it. It's working perfectly. And I said, well, so how much is that going to be? And he said, well, parts are $15. <laughs> OK. And how much is your time? He said, well, I'm $25 an hour. I said, oh, no, you're way more than that, because <laughs> you just saved me thousands of dollars. <laughs> so he gave him a bonus. But I was reminded again about, uh, first of all, I never could have discovered it. I could have read that manual for eternity, and I never could have discovered it. Uh, but also, the importance of background knowledge. So even if we're doing inquiry, it appears that giving lots of background knowledge before you apply it would make a significant difference. So, so 
uh, again, it appears that explicit instruction are needed when one, you're a novice, like I was, uh, when you have no background knowledge, which I didn't, and when you're learning something new, which I was, uh, then it's needed. Uh, if I uh, had spent many years uh, repairing these, then I would not have needed that, I could have uh, used uh, ex sort of accelerating my learning. So we are gonna focus this whole conference on learning. Uh, and uh, the reason for this is so often I see us doing activities in our classes, teaching lessons in our classes, but the intent is to get through the lesson, is to get through the activity and not necessarily learning. Uh, and so we need to refocus. Uh, every lesson should have an outcome where we are focused on what everyone? Learning, everybody, and more. Learning, I don't see the people in the back uh, participating. Pretty soon I'm gonna have to move back and monitor you, because uh, physical proximity with piercing eye contact would work. Uh, so, and more, what everyone? Learning and more learning. Uh, and that is what we are about. And so would you read this with me? I'm going to say the next word. No system or? in the world has made significant Game. for students without a relentless focus on the Learning. and Teaching. process. And that is what this conference is focused on. This uh, careers are focused on. This is what your lives are focused on, is learning, 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 and the teaching that could help bring that about. So one day, uh, I was in uh, New York, city uh, and uh, I usually write books and things in coffee shops uh, and so I went around the neighborhood and found a bowl shop you know one of those places where you get your bowl and then they fill it and you're supposed to take tofu and I took beef but anyway uh, so uh, then I sat down with my computer and I said I'm going to make up sort of a manifesto, a limited list of things uh, that if we kept our focus on these, that it would make a difference. Uh, and so uh, this is a preview uh, that if I was to do that in every day, in every class, in every lesson, we'd focus on learning what everyone? Critical, Critical content. Uh, we would tell the students the goal, the red is the hint, uh, and we would have lessons that were engaging instructional lessons, uh, and we would involve the students, uh, and we would monitor students' responses, uh, and we would um, monitor their responses to give them feedback, uh, and we would provide three types of uh, practice deliberate practice and retrieval practice and space practice. Uh, and we would also manage uh, with uh, all of the knowledge that we have in that area, particularly from uh, positive behavioral intervention and support. Uh, and we would have very positive teacher-student relationships. Uh, so that is what we're going to look at. And raise your hand if John has is a name you're really familiar with. Excellent. Woo, yay, Ohio. <laughs> See, now, did I, I didn't bracket Ohio because I worked on my brackets this morning. <laughs> I didn't put Ohio State as the virtual winner, but I did put them getting by two different levels. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I put the ducks in the center. Oh. All right, but anyway, <laughs> good job knowing John Hattie. So John Hattie is an educator who is actually uh, from New Zealand, but he now is in Australia, but he went to my alma mater when I was teaching at University of Washington. So I take total credit for him, but <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know him there. All right, so, but he gives us a great gift because he and now a very large team takes research from many, 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 many sources, uh, evaluates the quality of the research, uh, and then puts studies together uh, to get an idea of how effective that was. 
For example, uh, if we had from 0 to 1 uh, and 0.4 uh, to 1 is a zone of desired effects. And interestingly enough, uh, this is uh, used greatly also in the area of medicine. Uh, and I just went to saw my physician when I popped back into Portland last Friday, and she said, this has an effect size of 7.2. And I said, ooh, good. And she said, you know, effect sizes. Yeah. Uh, we use them in education too. So we're going to use that today just to uh, guide us a little bit in what makes a difference. So uh, the first one uh, is the learning needs to focus on critical what everyone content. Now this conference uh, is on literacy is organized around the simple view of reading, which you're so familiar with. Uh, and the areas related to decoding and the, re, uh, uh, the areas related, related to language comprehension. So let's just do a quick review of critical content in the area of reading. Uh, one, we want students to be able to read, uh, read the beautiful alphabetic code in our, langu our written language. Uh, and so in decoding, we're going to have uh, what everyone Print concepts, do they know top to bottom, left to right, do they know letter names? Uh, and uh, so here's an interesting little thought. Uh, when I was teaching last week in Michigan uh, on uh, decoding, uh, one of the studies uh, reminded me that one reason that students learn letter names faster than sounds is letter names sound like words. And they've learned labels before that sound like words, like uh, so that they learn A and B versus A and B, which take more time. Okay, you're not excited by that point. Okay, act excited. Ooh, oh, all right, good job. Uh, and then uh, they... Uh, students need phonological awareness, which under that big umbrella also is uh, phonemic awareness. Uh, and we're very blessed, really, to have one of the people who writes more uh, beautifully in this area, uh, David Kilpatrick, sitting right up here. Uh, and he talks about how we need to continue our work on uh, phonemic awareness in terms of blending and segmenting. Uh, be my students for a moment. I'll say the sounds and you say the word. I'll say the sounds and you say the word. Man. What word? Man. Good job. Uh, and arm out. Do it, do it, do it, do it. <clears throat> the word is man. What word, everyone? Man. And touch for each sound. First sound. Next sound. Next sound. And blend it. <laughs> Ooh, good job. So, yes, that you should be doing, uh, continuing to work on blending and segmenting, but also do exercises for advanced phonological awareness, such as this. You're going to have to look at me. I wish I was taller, but it hasn't worked out. Uh, <laughs> So look, and you know why I'm not on a stage? Look at the research and management about proximity, uh, particularly for people whose behavior is not perfect. You move in on them, uh, and I'm perfect. Uh, and so that's why I'm not on the stage. It's all about that. And sometimes when I teach middle school, I wish I could levitate. Uh, anyway, so looking at me, uh, and uh, the word is Pam. What word, everyone? Pam, take away the p, and what is left is am. So we have am, and we add, and the word is ham. Uh, it's just a taste of the kind of advanced phonological awareness we would do. And of course, students need to be taught letter sound associations. I mean, we have an alphabetic system. Those letters are a code for sounds uh, that are in, as we do orthographic mapping. Uh, and uh, the students also need to have sight vocabulary, uh, which is an area that uh, is really important, but it's not due to visual memory. It's very related to your phonics and your phonological uh, awareness. And uh, we also want students to be fluent, which would include accuracy, appropriate rate, and prosody or expression. Uh, so under language comprehension, uh, we know that your ability to comprehend is very related to your and also to your what, everyone? Your academic, academic and also your ability to make inferences 
uh, and your academic language skills and your narrative skills. Can you retell a sequence? Can you retell a story? So this is critical content. And so we know in the area of reading that what our teachers need to do and put time into are these exact elements that make the most difference. Uh, so now, again, uh, raise your hand if you're special ed interventions or have low performing students in your classes. Okay? And so when we look at that group, we have to even be more conscious of focusing on what is critical. Uh, just as you did with Olivia, you narrowed it down and you focused right in uh, consistently as the coach uh, on what she needed. Uh, and so particularly for our struggling students, we need to narrow the content so that we can make a difference in their achievement. So my motto here is, particularly for uh, struggling students is teach the stuff and cut the fluff, everybody. Teach the stuff and cut the fluff. And even core reading programs are tend to be fluffy. Uh, and so then we have to, with the lower the group, cut out the fluff and really hone in on what's gonna make the most difference. So the first big idea is focus on critical content. Uh, and uh, the second one, uh, I'm gonna read when I stop, say the next word. Clearly communicate the lessons oh. to promote. Uh, now, as long as I have been in education, and this is my blessed 52nd year uh, of teaching, uh, there has been goals. There has been behavioral goals. There have been I do statements. There have been I will statements. Uh, and, but all of them had the intent to convey to students what the lesson was about so the teacher could focus on it and the students could focus on it. Uh, and uh, so if we look at Hattie's um, outcomes, uh, and uh, just having a goal has a very high effect size, uh, particularly if it is told and then reiterated throughout the lesson. Uh, so we know that we need goals. Now today, as I travel the world, it appears that what is most often being done is learning intentions and success criteria as a way to convey the goal. So the learning intention, like one day I was teaching vocabulary for this uh, actual uh, passage. Uh, and this was a student's learning intention. Uh, and read it with me and go. Students will understand the meaning of key vocabulary words and use the words correctly. Uh, so that I wanted them to be able to know the meaning and be able to use them uh, both uh, so that they had it receptively and expressively. Uh, and the content was from Arctic Expedition. And these, this was a success criteria that they would, if I told them the meaning, would be able to tell me what the word is and that they could write a sentence uh, that include that vocabulary. But one of the things about new work on let me see if I, uh, on learning intentions, is that often they could be used again and again. For example, that learning intention I could use for every time I taught vocabulary in science, in social studies, in math, in like, and that is useful. My, one of my goals, and should be for all of us who work with teachers, uh, is to look for things that are high outcome uh, and low prep. Raise your hand if you like high outcome low prep. Uh, so uh, having repeatable learning intentions would meet that. Um, so the day I taught this, uh, we uh, had a check for understanding. Uh, you're going to be my students. I'm thinking of a word up here, uh, how the ducks will feel uh, at the end of uh, the uh, March Madness on your table, form the number. It's a one, two, three, or four, or five. Form the number on your table. Don't resist uh, everybody on the table. I need to see fingers. One, two, three, four. Which word here would be how the ducks will feel at the end? Uh, Okay, Michigan State, uh, Michigan. We got Michigan people here. Okay. okay, Ohio State. Okay, we'll now make it Ohio State. Hi in the air, show me. Okay, and the word is what, everyone? Triumph. Triumph. Okay, well, 
we had to add other. <laughs> Ducks is only you, though. Okay. So, uh, but uh, I'm skipping a little bit. This is online for you, this uh, PowerPoint that goes with this. Uh, so, what could be the motto for giving kids the goal? Sometimes I'm just amazed at how clever I was. <laughs> OK, so the motto, and reading it with me, everyone. You cannot come out without an outcome. <laughs> yeah, that took me all day to work on. Uh, OK, but it's true. Uh, and one recent study uh, asked students what they remembered about a lesson. And what was interesting is that they remembered the goal uh, that was uh, stated uh, for them. And so if we teach it, uh, tell them what the goal is during the lesson, they're more likely to focus on it. But it appears they're also more likely to learn what was the intentionality of instruction. Well, uh, and this one is, of course, uh, my favorite. And read it with me and go. Provide quality, engaging instructional lessons that yield learning. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, science and the art form of great teaching. Uh, and that we would use explicit instruction procedures. And if we look at Hattie, uh, again, very high effect sizes for instructional, explicit instruction, for direct instruction, for mastery learning, uh, all of them are highly related. Uh, so, uh, Many of us were taught things such as demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. Raise your hand if that language seems really uh, ones that you've heard before. Demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. Um, so that was very much uh, what was used uh, when I was teaching universities. And I was asked by the Council for Exceptional Children to write a book with some colleagues on instruction. And so we wanted to coin words that would be memorable. So we coined the words of I do it, we do it, you do it. Uh, demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. So everybody with your hands, and I will be looking back there and over here. Uh, I might have to leap up. Yes, I will, uh, to monitor you better. Okay, excellent. I do it, we do it, you do it. Everybody, I do it, we do it, you do it. Sometimes, though, it's not that clear. For example, I was teaching uh, a, a group of middle school kids uh, in Michigan how to write a summary of what they had read, uh, and it would be more like this. I do it. We do it, we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it. Holiday up. We do it, we do it, we do it. Now you're really good, and you do it. Uh, so I plucked out uh, a perfect example of this uh, that was related to a trip that I took with friends uh, to uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand because I had an opportunity uh, to teach I do it, we do it, you do it, uh, to a teacher in Vietnam, and even make her a poster that said, I do it, we do it, you do it, to hang uh, in her office. So here she is. Uh, and so it was in Hanoi, and in the morning of the we had gone, my traveling mates, uh, had gone to uh, the war museum in uh, Hanoi. Uh, and uh, we said, maybe we should do something lighter this afternoon. So we decided to take cooking classes. Uh, so we went, and there she was, our instructor. Uh, and uh, so our instructor uh, said, uh, welcome. Uh, and today I'm going to teach you how to make Vietnamese salad rolls. And my sister was one of my travel mates and her husband and then a number of professors, uh, friends. Uh, and so um, we said she got up on a stage uh, and she said, watch me make one. 
I said to my sister, woo, I do it. <laughs> so first thing she said is, uh, what you need is a round basket. Oh, we don't have any baskets. Uh, we've been ha we better pick some baskets. Because we, we make them all the time, but we don't have a basket. And she says, and then you want to put the rice cake uh, in the basket. Uh, and, but you do not, we always soak ours. Uh, don't soak it. Just get your fingers wet and put it on there. OK. Then she said, you're going to fold it in one third on each side. Uh, and then you're ready to put the ingredients in. And you have them on your table, but don't do anything with them yet. Uh, my turn. Uh, I said, oh, good. She's so good at demonstration. Uh, and then she said, the first thing you're going to do is put uh, your, you see that you have uh, some bean sprouts there. You're going to put a wide layer of bean sprouts. Uh, and uh, then you are going to, after that, uh, you're going to put parsley so that the bright color shows through. Uh, and then she said, uh, then you're going to put one piece of pork, uh, unless you're a Jew. She must have known some friends. Uh, and so you put that down, uh, and then you have a shrimp. Now, there's shrimp on your table, but you have to open them up and clean them out before you lay it down. And then... You would be ready to fold it tightly together, and you're going to roll it tight, 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 tight. I said, oh, wow, such a good job doing demonstration. And then she turned to this group of people, and she said, well, now it's your turn. Make one. I said, oh, no, no. <laughs> she skipped the week. So she's coming down the steps, and I went like this, come over here. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I would like you to go step by step and guide our table through this. And then I laid down $20, and she said, yes. Uh, <laughs> so now you're going to pretend, and I expect you to pretend. I expect superintendent to pretend here. Uh, I'll be watching uh, very carefully. Uh, so. So she said, OK, first you need a what, everyone? A basket. Put it in front of you. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Uh, and then she said, what do you need next? A rice cake. And uh, are you going to soak it? No, put the rice cake in. I don't see your rice cake. Uh, there you go. OK, good. Uh, and then, uh, but you need to dampen it. Get the water in the and dampen it. And then fold it in how much, everyone? A third. Uh, and then you're going to lay down sprouts. OK, lay in. Er, see, now you get yours more in the middle. Uh, two <laughs> sprouts, Susan. Uh, very good. OK, excellent. You don't like sprouts, so you need more sprouts. OK, <laughs> all right. And then after that, you're going to put parsley in, but you want it so that the green shows through the rice cake. So put that row in. Excellent. And then you're going to add a piece of pork. How many? One, unless you're a Jew. Uh, and then after that, you're going to uh, add to it, and you're going to do the shrimp. Uh, you're going to put it in whole? No. OK, open it up, clean it out. That one still needs more cleaning. OK, don't put that one down. OK, and then pull it in and roll it, everybody. Tight, 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 tight. So uh, she led us beautifully, I mean, wonderfully, step by step, uh, being certain that we'd be good at it. And then she said, can I leave? And I said, yes, you can. You can go to other tables and guide them. Uh, uh, but uh, this, uh, just show you what happened. Um, so here are uh, my travel mates. Uh, and a professor on the side of my 79-year-old um, uh, brother-in-law uh, there. And here, here we are. Ooh. Uh, yes, and then she left us, and we made these on our own uh, very well. Uh, and the next day, we did go to uh, a print shop. And I made her a poster uh, of I do it, we do it, you do it. And we went back to the cooking school to deliver a little Americana to her uh, on instruction. But you know, here's the problem. If this was the only time uh, we know that we need uh, actually very deliberate practice uh, that is over time. Uh, so a few days later, 
we were out in Hanoi Bay, and the tour guide said, well, we're going to give you the experience of crawling through uh, the very narrow tunnels that were dug by the Viet Cong. <laughs> Just was thinking, <laughs> crawling. OK, maybe I don't need that experience. Maybe friends could bring pictures back. Uh, maybe they could tell me about it. So I stayed on the ship. Uh, and I joined the crew uh, making uh, salad rolls for space practice. And then when the picture was taken, I took, OK, I have to convince, confess here, because I asked the woman next to me, can I put those in front of me? The only one that is mine is that sort of fat one that you can see at the end. <laughs> but uh, despite the story, I do it, we do it, you do it. As simple as that verbiage sounds, it is extraordinarily useful because many of our teachers uh, go do, I do it, you do it, leaving out the most powerful part, the we do it. And then some teachers do the you do it. Open up your book, do set A, B, C, and D, I'll be at my desk. And that is really weak instruction. Uh, so demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding uh, makes a difference in the past. It makes well, uh, what else? So uh, basically, the motto at the bottom is, everybody, how well I teach equals how well they learn, that there is a direct relation between the two. So uh, and then we need to have these students actively in And uh, here is a list of the kind of <laughs> procedures we could use, uh, verbal procedures, written procedures, um, gesture procedures that we could use to get students actively engaged. But we have to do it, uh, re making the instruction interactive. Um, and um, number four, uh, and everybody, uh, there is the motto, and read it with me and go. Learning is not a spectator sport. When I teach middle school and high school, I see so many students who believe that if their body has made it to class, they've really met their entire obligation. They seem like shocked that I'm going to have them say things and write things and do things and say things to partners. And I have to explain to uh, that for you to learn, you have to retrieve information, you have to practice information, you have to be present here, you cannot be texting underneath the table. Uh, woo uh, maybe that doesn't happen in your district, but other places. Uh, so uh, I really have to explain to them uh, to get them on board to understanding why we have active participation. And when they participate, and they're saying things, and they are learning things, uh, we need to monitor. And here's the problem with this one. And I saw this just when I was with all those principals in Modesto, California, for a week. Uh, and that is, teachers may monitor, but they're not adjusting their lesson based on the monitoring. And so if the students have made errors, you correct it and you firm them. Uh, you don't just let it go by. Uh, monitoring means you do something. Um, so down at the bottom is from Stan Payne's work, one of my favorite uh, uh, mottos and uh, adages that we need to walk around, look around, talk around. Everybody, walk around, look around, talk around. Now that means that when the students are saying things to partners, when they are uh, uh, writing, uh, when they are reading, we as teachers uh, are walking around, looking around, talking around. Uh, so one day I was writing in New York City where, where I had an apartment for five years for the grant. Uh, and I was at Dunkin' Donut. It had a 24-hour Dunkin' Donut, so you could write late at night. Love it. Uh, so I went and there was about I would say 25 to 35 of New York's finest there the first night I went, uh, all enjoying Dunkin' Donuts. And then uh, I came back the next night in the same group, slightly altered, uh, but 25, 35, for 10 consecutive days, Dunkin' Donuts was full. And I tell you, it was safe. It was safe. It was, I mean, really nothing was happening in Dunkin'. Um, but I thought they could benefit from a little educational research. <laughs> like, maybe 
I mean, even their badges said that they were uh, New York's uh, neighborhood patrol. New York's neighborhood patrol. So I thought they might want to walk around, look around, talk around. <laughs> and maybe the west side of Manhattan would have been safer. So again, I'm sort of into posters. So I made some really nice posters. Uh, walk around, look around, talk around. And took it to all the precincts in the upper west side. Uh, and. Um, now, I don't know if anyone was totally inspired by it, but I posted one in Dunkin' Donut. Uh, so, but we need to do that. So one day I went into a high school, and in the teacher's room was a big sign that said, teach from your feet, not from your seat, everybody. Teach from your feet, not from your seat. Well, that would be walk around, look around, talk around. And we need to uh, give feedback. Uh, and that feedback could be uh, affirmation, that feedback could be uh, uh, not only affirmation but corrections. Uh, so look at the high effect size of feedback. Wow. So I know that uh, if I'm teaching uh, in a small reading group and a student makes an error, I'm going to correct their error immediately as feedback. Uh, if students are on task, uh, we have uh, individuals here that are involved in positive behavioral uh, support systems, which talk about giving three to one positive or four to one positive to any redirect. I am going to uh, give that feedback. So I often look at it this way. Uh, I'm going to uh, P for what, everyone? Praise. E for in. Courage and C for correct. So maybe these students are writing. Uh, and so I move around the room, because I do walk around, look around, talk around. And in the talk, I'm going to praise, encourage, correct, what we call peck, peck, peck. So I come to you uh, and I say, X a topic sentence that announces the subject, the topic. All the other sentences go with it. Excellent job. And you even use transition words. Woo. Uh, so you could move to your next paragraph. Or it could be E for encourage. Uh, we're writing now. Uh, or it could be a correction. So you have excellent details here, and they go with your plan. You need to have a sentence that introduces it, that tells what the whole thing is about. You think about it, I'll be back. Um, so we would provide feedback. Uh, and, okay, <laughs> very clever motto here. <laughs> and read it with me and go. Feedback feeds back. Like, so good, but it's true <laughs> that if I give you feedback, it gives you uh, nourishment back that helps change your uh, behavior, that raises you up closer to what our goal is. Well, uh, and practice. Now, if there is one thing I'm concerned about in our schools, uh, it is that we have demified practice. We've had models. That is drill and care. Drill, no, we have not one reported incident on death by practice. Uh, so you're working with this small group and you say, well, you know, we're working on fluency. Let's read the passage again. Dead. <laughs> you're working over here in writing and saying, you know, we really haven't quite mastered the organization of an argument. Uh, we're going to write another one this week. Dead. Even internationally, not one report of death by practice because it simply is not true that we know that we need to have practice. Uh, and the three big things you'll find in the research is deliberate practice, where you know exactly what the success criteria is, and you as a student are working towards that. Uh, but space practice, uh, not having it all in one session, uh, but having it over time. And we have to look at our curriculum because basically uh, even the best core reading programs, they teach vocabulary one day, they bless the children and move on. Uh, they do not come back 
and touch it again, and it drops right out of their repertoire. I mean, this is serious things that we need to analyze to improve the outcomes. Uh, and we need retrieval practice, where the students have practice uh, retrieving it from memory. I just was in a class where the teacher was doing review sounds. I'm sitting next to the principal, uh, and uh, this was just uh, when I was in Modesto, uh, and the teacher does this. The teacher holds up the letter M and says, let's review what we have learned in terms of letter sounds. This is the letter M. Its sound is M. Mm. Everybody say the sound M. Mm. And then this is the letter A. Its sound is A. Ah. Everybody what sound? And went through all of it. And the principal wrote down, ooh, good job having review. And I had to say to the principal, let's step out into the hall. Uh, because the problem with that is it's so scaffolded that no one had to think. Uh, and so the teacher has uh, over scaffolded. Uh, so what would be better is simply retrieval practice. Puts up the letter M and says, what sound? Good job. Uh, and of course, you're all reading people. If you missed, mm, we have the remedial session tonight. Uh, so, uh, but it is that kind of thinking we have to analyze. What are we doing in terms of practice? Because the lack of our practice is reducing the outcomes for students. Well, uh, and look at the high effect sizes uh, for practice. Deliberate practice, retrieval practice, space practice makes a huge difference in literacy and all content areas. Um, this is just an example where a district sat down and said, right, they don't have any spaced practice uh, for vocabulary. Let us make a schedule so that we are coming back to it and teaching for learning, not for forgetting. Teaching for learning, not for forgetting. And here is the motto for this. And this one had great changes over time. Uh, and read it with me and go. Perfected practice over time makes perfect and permanent. Uh, practice doesn't make perfect, only perfected as you get more accurate at it through I do it, we do it, you do it, uh, then uh, it can become perfect and uh, permanent. But as I looked at this, uh, there is no situation where we can just think about instruction, where we have to uh, always think simultaneously about management. You know, I have had so many young teachers say to me, Anita, I'm an excellent teacher, but a poor manager. This is not possible. These are linked for eternity. Uh, and every decision we make is instructionally for learning, but also in great, in, is a behavioral element. Let me just give you a perfect example. I'm doing a demonstration in kindergarten, uh, and the teacher's written a plan out for me, a vocabulary that I'm to introduce, and one of them was scamper, uh, because it was in the big book. Uh, and she said, after scamper, just have the 22 kindergarten children get up and scamper around the room. <laughs> I'm looking at that and saying, no. Uh, so when we got there, I said, make a road, make a person, scamper down the road, scamper down. We got all the glory and none of the behavior problems. We just cannot separate these two. My instruction affects your behavior. My be your behavior affects my instruction. These are linked together uh, for all time. So just a reminder, because raise your hand, because I've already met two people who do consulting in uh, positive uh, behavior intervention and support. So raise your hand if that is you too, that you, your district does it, your school does it. Okay, yeah. Uh, so what do we have under this? Well, create a well-organized, safe environment. Um, okay. This is actually where my cleverness over time has really emerged. It's in management. So we know that teachers have routines. It makes a difference. My ma and everybody, the motto is predictability predicts ability. <laughs> but it does. The students know what to do when they don't have a pencil, what to do uh, when they didn't bring their work in, what to do if there's a fire drill. Uh, routines are very predictive of the behavior in our classes. Uh, and 
uh, the students do best when there is clarity. In fact, if you look at research, uh, instruction, and in behavior, both of them need clarity. Because what we expect equals what we get. But this is, to me, uh, the center management law. And that is, if you expect it, pre-correct it. If you expect it, pre-correct it. Almost all behavioral problems, we foresaw the challenge, but we didn't take care of it. So recently, I went to a school concert. Uh, and I have a godson who is going to be doing a solo in sixth grade in the concert. And so they're all lined up. Uh, and he is digging deep in his nostril. <laughs> and then his time for a solo, and he kept doing it right through the solo. <laughs> so afterwards, I met with the choir director, and I said, has that ever happened to you before? Oh, it happens every year. They're always fidgeting and doing things. I said, well, maybe next year you could like pre-correct it. Uh, maybe you could go through such things as we stand and we face them, and we hold our hands them and we never let go of our hands uh, ever, 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 and don't fidget, and we sing beautifully and smile at them. And he said, that's a good idea. And I said, yep, that's a good idea. If you expect it, pre-correct it. And it truly is the centerfold of all management. Uh, and uh, then uh, provide acknowledgement and we've all said catch them being good, uh, which is uh, something we know is honoring them for behavior that allows them to learn and for us to teach. Uh, there are two of my very favorites. One is if you expect it, pre-correct it. But the second is uh, avoid the void for they will fill it. Everybody, avoid the void for they will fill it. I have the, a year ago, the great blessing of spending a good time in San Jose uh, in all of the Catholic schools. And I can tell you uh, that uh, their children are just like our public school uh, students, exactly the same, uh, that when there was a void, they didn't say, woo, time to take out my rosary and do a few <laughs> Hail Marys. Uh, they had the same behavioral problems. So avoid the will fill in. You know, this was, we have some of the finest people in this room, and this is, all of this is just to remind us, to keep us on track of what makes a difference. Uh, I just had a school say, well, we don't do any of this. We are a progressive school, really progressive school, really progressive school. I said, let me tell you about the word progressive. Uh, in it is the word progress. Uh, and a progressive school should be one that has the highest level of progress for their children. And so, how are your scores? Uh, oh, not so good. Okay, see, all right. Uh, so we had a, an interesting conversation. Progressive, it makes a difference. Uh, so, uh, looking here, the last one is uh, on uh, the teacher-student relationship. And let's look at the effects. Uh, I greet you at the door. I smile at you. I meet you. Uh, I know about your fluency because it's up to woo. Uh, I uh, know that you have new tennis shoes today because I notice this kind of things. Uh, I give you a smile. I give you a thumb up. Uh, I, all of that is teacher-student relationship. Uh, and it does make a difference. Uh, and uh, one day I was in a school and they had a sign that's also in my house. Uh, uh, be kind, be kind, be kind. And it appears to me that all of our children need deep kindness now. Uh, our world needs kindness. Uh, there are so many events that are occurring that are not kind. Uh, and just uh, on this trip, I just stopped to watch uh, the kindness. Uh, I, uh, about a year ago, I had long black hair, and then one day I woke up and it was very curly. I mean, we're talking super curly. My sister said, I wonder about your ethnic background, uh, because it was like so curly. Uh, and so I went to my hairstylist and 
he, I said, what am I going to do? And he said, I recommend you cut it, <laughs> okay, because it, and then he said, while you're at it, uh, let it go gray. I said, well, no, let's let it go silver, okay, uh, and so, but ever since I've done this, people uh, keep thinking that I might need more service. Uh, do you need a wheelchair? Uh, can I carry that? Can I put that up? And so I, my uh, kindness ratio has gone way up with, and I just got a new driver's uh, uh, passport, and when I turned in the passport, it said color of hair, silver. Um, waiting, not great, but we'll see. But I just stood and watched all of the kindness of everyday people on this trip. Uh, I had a great attendant uh, from Houston here, uh, and he said, oh, uh, uh, let's put your bag, because uh, he said, you're, you're very short, uh, so you can't lift it. Let me just lift it up there. Uh, and then he said, if you want anything out, I said, no, uh, no thank you, uh, but afterwards, and uh, it just was so kind. And then I got to the hotel, uh, and just kindness everywhere. Uh, and this is what we need to bring to our school. One of my good friends, and you probably know his name from literacy research, uh, Carnine, uh, did his work in education, wrote 89 books, uh, and and now he's writing books on kindness. Uh, and he's quite convinced that uh, what we need to do for our own souls and for all of the children that we touch uh, is bring eyes and ears and words of kindness to them. So thank you for being kind to allow me uh, to come here uh, to uh, cheer on Ohio State, which wins at least two brackets. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And so these are the big points. And truly, if we did them every day in every class, it would make a difference in Ohio. Uh, but uh, the bottom is the motto that sort of sums this all up in the red. Uh, and everybody, if you could end with this and go. Teach with passion, manage with compassion. Have a great, great, great conference. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.